like each of you to think of one to three things in your life that's getting in the way of you being more consistently happy. So most people, there's lots of things, you know, your boss's attitude, the timing of things, society's attitude, your weight. Just take a moment right now and reflect on one to three things, just make a note of, that get in the way of you being just happier. Things that kind of plague your mind that get in the way of you feeling lighter and more joyful all the time. Got it? So the goal of this speech is for you by the end to think that those same things that are getting in the way of your happiness to become things that create your happiness. When I was asked to share my story here today, my first thought was, I'm not sure that I have anything that interesting to say for 45 minutes. Um, about myself. And then, just the title popped into my head. Mistakes, coincidences, hard work, and magic. And I thought to myself, all right, there, there's something that I have to say to people. For those of you who don't know me, I am an international yoga teacher and I am known as the Queen of Handstands. How does one get that royal title, you may ask yourself? The answer is mistakes, coincidences, hard work, and magic. But actually, my upbringing wasn't, you know, unusual. I had a dad who was an accountant. My mom was a mathematician. My brothers are a lawyer, engineer, and accountant as well. Where I come from, a handstand queen is not a thing. There was no realm of possibilities where that existed. And yet, this job that may as well have been made for me happened. And it put me on a fairly direct path to happily ever after. But actually, when I was a kid, I was gonna be the first female president of the United States of America. <laughs> and thank God that dream faded because, well, I will let you fill in the blank on that one. <laughs> but um, that's where my head was when I was a little girl. And then around the age of 11, I decided that that was boring and I wanted to be an actress. I did some theater and commercials and upon graduating high school, I got into a pretty prestigious conservatory theater program at the University of Southern California. Acting is not an advisable career choice, but I had parents who believed in me, and I got a scholarship, so I went for it. I went for it. So hard. Four years. Hundreds of auditions. And then I failed. I knew that I failed because I never got cast. Nobody wanted to hire me. And when it came time to quit, I, I felt really good about the choice. And that's how I knew it was the right decision, but it was still heartbreaking because giving up on a dream is really disappointing. But at the same time, it was liberating. After I made the decision, someone close to me said, well, it's too bad you wasted all those years and money in theater school. And when I heard that, it was like a thunderbolt of truth went through my body. No, I didn't. That's the thing that happens so often when we fail. We think that all the work that we put into succeeding in that particular venture is only good for that one thing. But it's not. It never is. I trusted what was in my heart as a teenager. I picked a major in university that gave me an invaluable education, which looking back now is very much the foundation of what I teach today. And I'll explain. 
For those of you who don't know about the University of Southern California, it's a conservative school with 20,000 undergraduates that boasts about its many billionaire alumni and its American football team. But in my program, there were 14 of us, and we took classes where we were required to dance to tribal music, to crawl on the floor like animals, and to sing at the top of our lungs. We even had a famous actress from Star Trek come in, the original one, and give us a semester-long course on clowning. I was required to take clowning at a top 25 American university. That was my education. <laughs> I was bad at it. I was not funny. I had this, like my clown character had a cape and it was pink and I wore a sparkle bracelet around my head and underwear outside of my tights, but it was just as stupid and weird as it sounds. I didn't get the clowning thing, but I knew that it was good for me. Even if you're not good at something, it doesn't mean that it's not good for you. What I learned in theater school was how to let go of social conditioning so that I could tap into a truth that's more authentic and real. The ongoing question for all four years of university was, what does it mean to be human? We were taught to consider each character we played as an aspect of ourselves. To think, speak, feel, and then act from our character's perspective. So our characters weren't a mask that we were putting on, they were a way of life, of seeing the world that we were embodying. And with each role that we played, we were taking ownership of another aspect of ourselves. Because ultimately, we are all one. There, in that very conservative school, I received a wildly spiritually liberating education. Imagine if all of us had four years to think like that. You are your enemy. You are your hero. All of it is a mirror of you. All of it is you. I didn't know it at the time, but that's where my message to the world began to take shape. While it's common and understandable, looking back with regret is a waste of energy. Even if right now you don't understand why the things that are happening to you are happening, just be confused. Just be confused. Live with the confusion. Trust in the uncertainty. We aren't told that. We search for certainty because it feels comfortable. But that search limits our vision and our potential. You don't need to have all the answers ever. Trust yourself. Trust in the X factor. And trust what life has brought your way and commit to the belief that you will figure it out. <coughs> that kind of steadfast stubbornness is how we make gold. Now is the time for more of us to wake up to our alchemical, magical powers. We all have the ability to turn any situation into the best situation. Be confused and confident at the same time. With that attitude, you give yourself the opportunity to see how things may indeed be coming together. It's just not the way you expected it to look. Be confused, wait it out, try to chill, and then just see what happens. Although I had been doing yoga since I was 16, after quitting acting, becoming a yoga teacher was never anything that seriously crossed my mind. Acting's a hobby. So 
said the former actress. So, I went to traditional Chinese medical school. Yeah, it's a weird choice for a Polish-American girl to want to go to traditional Chinese medical school and be a Chinese doctor. But that's what was in my heart, and so I went for it. Chinese medical school was fascinating. It was fascinating. But it was not theater school. There was no singing and dancing, and except for the occasional Tai Chi course, graduate school was four years of book learning and memorizing things that were super Chinese. <laughs> I'm a bit dyslexic, and I struggle with rote mem memorization, so I had a very, very hard time. Fortunately, I do have an incredible work ethic. I cultivated this work ethic because I was dyslexic. As a kid, although my brain functioned a little differently than most A students, I still saw myself as an A student. And so I put in the work, that I needed to to get the grades that I felt worthy of. My struggles with learning made me a really hard worker. It not only taught me great um, discipline, but also excellent organizational skills. And those organizational skills make me a very desirable hire, especially in the yoga industry. Every cloud has a silver lining. Trusting it and understanding it just takes time. Too often people complain about their workload. As much as work may suck sometimes, complaining about it is another huge waste of energy. A practice I recommend is catching yourself. Whenever you notice yourself starting a self-pity party, take a breath. Put your head down, do your work, and it will be done. Less thinking, more doing. That's it. Fighting the inevitable only makes it more draining. The faster you can accept the work that needs to be done, the easier it is to just do it. What's even better is if you can find the fun and fulfillment in your responsibilities. I'm good at fun. I can find the game in just about anything. It took a lot of practice. I'm not naturally entirely like this. I'm actually very serious in a lot of ways. But at this point, I can find the game in just about anything. I can honestly say that no matter what situation you put me in, I can make dealing with it feel good. But searching for, spotting, and then feeling the joy is a muscle that gets stronger with exercise. The same way your core gets stronger every time you practice, a playful disposition gets stronger with repetition and practice. It's an exercise that will rewire how you're programmed to think about things. To make work even more fulfilling, do the best job that you can. No matter how humble or sophisticated the task, by committing to doing a great job, you will feel more energized and better about the work. Shift the thoughts in your head, almost manually at first. You catch yourself and then shift it from, I don't feel like doing this, to how can I produce something amazing? Bringing a sense of pride to everything that you do cultivates greater self-esteem and in slowing down and being more thoughtful in your work, you're also likely to discover a more efficient way of doing things. It makes it easier. So you take whatever it is that you've been given and you practice finding reasons to smile while you do the very best that you can. With that humility, both your professional and personal growth will be so much smoother. The stressors don't go away. 
they don't. If anything, as we become more successful, the stressors become more sophisticated and complicated. The practice is learning how to metabolize those stressors like it's no big deal. Oh, it's another emergency. Okay, how do I deal? Can you guys in the back still hear me? There's room in the front as well. So, although the workload was large, Chinese medical school was not entirely, would you actually mind asking them about the sound? Thank you. So, anyway, although the workload was large, Chinese medical school wasn't entirely difficult for me. Learning the philosophy actually came naturally. It actually very much reminded me of what I learned in theater school. TCM, traditional Chinese medicine, is rooted in Taoism. And it centers on the notion that we are all our own universe. So just like each character in theater school was operating in a unique world with different forces that influence their thoughts and their actions, each patient's body is operating according to its own unique forces. So in Chinese medicine, we don't treat strictly based on the outstanding symptom. Instead, we treat the person who's living with the symptom. So if you three came to me with a headache, I would likely treat all three of you differently about, based on the rest of what I observed. I would ask questions about your sleep patterns and your poop shape and your appetite and a whole lot of other random and weird things. But these are the things that are my clues into your little universe. And then based on that, I would create a treatment plan. So I'm figuring out why there's a disharmony in this body that's manifesting the headache, rather than this needle goes here for a headache. It's different. Chinese medicine is complicated, and it requires a lot of practice to master. Right after I finished passing five board exams to get my license both in California and nationally in the U.S., my husband landed a great role that would move us to Singapore. Awesome, I thought. Now I get to practice Chinese medicine at the source in Asia. But when I arrived and I discussed my license with the powers that be in Singapore, I learned that there was no way for my US license to be accepted here. Well, I can find a mentor and study or take courses. Nope. All things Chinese medicine in Singapore are in Mandarin. All classes are in Mandarin and all doctors' offices are Mandarin speaking, so even when I went to a willing doctor's office, I didn't understand what they were saying and there were lots of things happening that I could not keep up with and I realized this was a giant waste of time. <laughs> what do you do? Go to yoga. I went to yoga, and it has been my constant since I was 16. I started it really randomly. Um, I grew up on Long Island, New York, and at that time, in Long Island, Long Island, you know where they talk like this? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah? That's where I'm from. They, um, there was no yoga. Um, but I stumbled upon it as a teenager who wanted to get fit. So I went to the CD store and I got two DVDs. I got Billy Blanks, Tai Bo, and Rodney Yee Yoga. I liked them both a lot. I loved them. I loved them. But there was something extra special about the yoga. I was intrigued by that elusive spiritual element it has. Rodney Yee it's up there on a mountain, speaking slowly and intentionally. And he was all exotic and Asian. I felt like he knew something that I didn't, and I was intrigued. 
At 16, I felt like this is something I want to be a part of. When I moved from Long Island to LA for university in 2003, I found my little yoga cult, the cult of handstands. We were a group of punk yogis who decided we were gonna add handstand in between every post. So it was like, sound up, handstand, warrior one, warrior three, handstand, handstand, handstand. You guys wanna see? There you go. Warrior one. Coming up. And then you do forward fold. Why not? I'll just do a mini handstand. And then well, what do we do from here? Uh, chaturanga. Up to all. It was awesome. There was like a whole group of us, 20, who were doing handstands all the time. It wasn't an a logical attraction, but I think just by watching you kind of get it. It feels powerful and freeing. And having a whole community of friends that did it together every day, I put my Chinese medical and university classes where I could around my yoga schedule, just to like be with my friends and do our handstands together. Having this group was freeing and powerful. So when I showed up to Singapore, I was also heartbroken. In addition to not getting to do Chinese medicine, handstands weren't that popular. And then this super negative voice in my head started talking to me. What are you doing here? Why did you give up your awesome life in LA? You had a career, people who loved you, a fantastic lifestyle. What are you doing here? I cried every day. But even when you think it should stop, life just keeps going. And I kept showing up to yoga. And although I had assisted my teacher's classes in LA, I, Truth is, I never wanted yoga to be my career because I was afraid that making it my profession would corrupt the purity of my love for it. And then it was in that broken state that another voice came up from inside of me. Built it. Built it. I realized that if I wanted a handstand community, I had to build it. And I knew it was a brilliant idea because handstands are awesome. Who wouldn't want to have a handstanding yoga practice? The next day I was in class and one of the senior teachers at Pure suggested that I teach there and I was like, yes. My first few classes at Pure were pretty full and then the numbers dropped. After a couple of weeks, my boss took me aside and told me that I should try some of the more popular teachers' classes and see if I could better connect with the local students. The message was that if I didn't get my numbers up, I would be fired. I went to the popular teachers' classes, but quickly I realized that there was no way I could teach like them. They were great, but they weren't me. I had a totally different understanding of flow, body mechanics, and I wanted to teach power poses. I wanted to teach handstand. I told myself, F it. I'm gonna teach the way I teach, and if I get fired, I'll figure it out. So I began to dig deep inside of myself to figure out how to get the local yogis into the cool poses that they loved and admired from Instagram, which was just starting to become popular at that point. And I realized that as well as my teacher's techniques had served me, it was not enough to pre impress the Singaporeans. You guys are tough. I also knew that if I wanted to make this work, I couldn't lose my cool because you guys can smell fear. 
took a beat, a step back, and my Chinese medicine hat kind of just fell on my head. I realized that instead of treating the outstanding symptom and inability to handstand, I needed to treat the individual yogi who was working on handstand. From that liberated perspective, waves of inspiration crashed over me. I realized that as long as I kept my students safe, I could use my 12 years of yoga and five years of Chinese medicine experience and create any technique that I wanted. I let go of doing things the correct way and finally things just got easy. I found my talent. It wasn't about delivering the best techniques that I had learned. It was about really seeing my student and making poses work in their individual bodies. Handstand, holding it when we're first learning, is different from everybody because each of us are built differently. Soon enough, students are lined up on wait lists to get in my classes. I spent the next few years working my butt off, teaching up to 14 group classes and 12 private lessons a week. I saw each student as an opportunity to learn more about people and holding patterns and how to break through them. Faster and faster, I, I could tell what was stopping a student from achieving their dream pose, and I could piece together a plan that would make it more accessible for them. I was on fire. My dreams of being a Chinese doctor dissipated, and my fear that making yoga my profession would ruin it for me <laughs> evaporated. Not being allowed to practice Chinese medicine was the best, worst thing that's ever happened to me. But before I found my niche on social media, Singapore, by its very nature, did me another upside down favor. My students moved because expats are transient. I am a feeler, and so this was heartbreaking for me. But then I learned that it was wonderful too because my students quickly became leaders in their new yoga communities and they invited me out to teach. And now I was a traveling yoga teacher known as the Queen of Handstand. As I speak about these things, it may be tempting for some of you to think, life doesn't work that way for me, Marisha. I'm here to tell you that if you practice having an open mind, being patient, and staying confident, even if your thoughts are telling you other things, believing, it might. It takes effort, but you have absolutely nothing to lose and everything to gain. Faith doesn't have to just be in a space God. Faith can be you trusting yourself and the life that you've built thus far. You never know how things could play out. And when we are in a positive, empowered headspace, we're better able to perceive how we can arrange things to make them work for us. My life turned into a dream beyond my wildest imagination. But then my husband came home with news that shattered my heart. It was time for us to move back to the US. We were only meant to be in Singapore for two years and we stayed an extra two for me, but he wasn't happy and it was time to go. The thought of leaving my yoga family devastated me. I hated leaving this incredible community of super strong and enthusiastic yogis who pushed me to be a great teacher. We moved to Colorado and while yoga is popular there, it's not big right here. In Colorado, people who are into yoga go two, three times a week. In Singapore, you go two, three times a day. That kind of level of dedication is just not something I'm going to have again. 
But fortunately, my role as an international yoga teacher had gained momentum, and by the time I moved to Colorado, I had cracked the social media nut. As so many things before, that one was tricky for me. What most people don't realize is that the vast majority of commercially successful people had a big break. They had a famous poster or a viral video. They had some twist of fate that catapulted their career and made them a name that you know. I didn't have a big break, but I did have something special. I'm a great yoga teacher. When Instagram switched from the 15 second to minute long format, my now business partner and student at the time, Christina, told me, Marisha, this is your opportunity to show the world what you do. What makes me a great teacher is my ability to simplify. Uh oh. What are we doing? Hello? Hello? Alright. What makes me a great teacher is my ability to simplify complex concepts. And that ability comes from my deep desire to help my students learn the things that they want to learn. I follow the student. I don't enforce. Also, I know it's not up to the students to understand me. It's up to me to figure out how to explain things so that it's more accessible for my students. It's never the student's fault. I could always be better for them. My communication skills got even better as I was traveling and teaching people for whom English is a second language. Communicating in a way that's easy for just about anyone to understand is a very valuable skill no matter what field you're in. Additionally, I'm comfortable being on screen because of my time making student films in university. Everything came together beautifully and making these short and popular videos for Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook was fun and easy. Social media also gave me the opportunity to share another one of my passions, journaling. In university, my best friend, who was in the process of coming out of the closet, would journal, and I began journaling with him. We did it every day, and I continue to do it every day. Journaling is something that I've been doing nearly every day for over 16 years. I love writing captions for social media, because I love expressing myself through writing. I see Instagram as my channel to put out into the world what I like and what I have to say. If any of you have a small business but struggle with social media because you feel uncomfortable with self-promotion, I encourage you to change the way that you view it. It's not so much about how do I sell myself. The real question is, what do I have to say to the world? What do you have to say? Create from that headspace. At first, you may not know, but if you practice digging deep and finding those answers about what you have to offer your community, creating will become fun. You will find your voice, and it will be a means of self-expression, an artistic endeavor. I give love through my social media, and I never worry that I will run out of inspiration. Even my mom was like, giving all this free advice is not smart. But I know that the wealth of knowledge that I have will never tap out because I'm a seeking spirit. And as I continue to learn, I have more to offer. That awareness gave me the confidence, it gives me the confidence to give it all away. Another tool that my best friend in university shared with me is meditation. We joined Buddhist Club together and began meditating. Meditation has enhanced my ability to choose my focus. So instead of being magnetically attached to worries that surface, meditation has enabled me to consciously refocus my mind on things that better serve me. 
The key is accepting the reality of a situation and then slowing down your reaction time. When we take that time to pause before we react, we get to sit with the feelings that surface, process them, and before we do things that just take us down that repetitive cycle, those habits that continually hold us back, we can choose differently. Training my mind in this way enabled me to create opportunities with greater ease and enjoy my life more because I get to choose my focus. I'm not attached to the reactions that may bubble up inside of me. Keeping it real while choosing to see how things are indeed coming together is a skill that takes a lot of practice. But it's practical and it is worth the effort. Still, my ability to constantly stay positive was never as massively challenged as it was until I moved back to the U.S. I became fearful because I got dragged into what I'm going to call an unimaginable pickle. The details of my pickle are complicated and they are not worth getting into right now. But trust me when I tell you that this pickle was extremely upsetting and completely inconceivable. I've always believed that every challenge has a valuable lesson behind it. And I believe that it's up to me to figure out that lesson. I did so much soul searching to figure out what would dissolve this painful karma. I worked on being more compassionate I worked on being more loving, patient, forgiving. I worked on being tougher. I worked on being stronger. And while strengthening those capabilities was wonderful, my pickle was relentless. I've heard it say that anything you can imagine is possible. Maybe that's true, but I can also say for sure the unimaginable is possible as well. What is more is after over a year of dealing with this pickle, this drama, I started to see the same pattern emerge in other areas of my life. Looking back now, I can see how my proper lesson tried to reveal itself to me. But my big, powerful, positive brain dismissed it. I thought I needed to be stronger. I thought I needed to learn to stand up for myself. I thought, and I thought, and I thought, it took nearly two years of trial and error for the lesson to finally become clear. And it happened when I decided I wanted to learn how to hear my instincts. I had gathered a lot of expert opinions about my pickle, and they only made things worse. I got advice that made things worse, way worse. I knew that I needed to learn self-reliance, but I was having a lot of difficulty trusting myself because I had made a bad judgment. 
this because I want to emphasize two main things. First, the tools that we cultivate to achieve our goals could be the very things that stop us from further progression. For me, that positive, relentless mindset was clouding my judgment, even though it had brought me to that height of being a queen of handstands. What worked may not always work the same way. The world is changing and it's changing fast. Stay present, stay humble, and stay open-minded. I also share this because even though it may sound odd to many of you, I'd like to introduce the idea of listening to your body. We are taught to listen to our superiors, our gurus, the internet, famous people, and while their advice may be worth considering, you were born in your own body with your own path to walk. You are a different character. You are your own universe, governed by unique forces. Our bodies are incredibly intelligent, but we've lost touch with that intelligence because we don't practice listening. Practice listening. Practice observing the forces at play in your universe, your body. Start small. Practice trying to hear what foods your body craves. Pushing past hunger or fullness just adds to confusion. But be mindful that uncrossing signals that have spent an entire lifetime being confused is going to take practice and persistence. But you got the rest of your life to work on it. Even if a diet plan seems to work on the outside, I can almost guarantee it's creating neurosis on the inside. Your body wants you to feel good. Practice listening to it. Practice trusting what it tells you. And if you make a mistake, try again, and again, and again, and again. Your body will still be there waiting for you to deepen your connection to it. What I have learned is that my heart speaks slowly and acts slowly. It takes in information with compassion and responds to most stimulus with gentle tenderness. My gut is a critic. It tells me when something isn't right and it tells me when to be cautious. My head is still speedy and very excitable, but it's learning. It's only one seat at this table. And it's learning to sit back and listen to my heart and gut. Now that I'm better able to integrate my body's intelligence, my head's positivity is more powerful and more effective. Take a moment now and look back at your one to three problems again. Just think about them. Remember that? Breathe in deeply and let out a sigh. Feel that. Do it again. Inhale. trusted friend. 
Your body wants you to be happy. There's no need to fight your instincts or shame yourself. There will be missteps and mistakes along the way, and they're nothing to be ashamed of. You're entitled to your mistakes. Learn. Don't blame anyone else or any circumstance. Work smarter. Follow your talent and your taste. Listen to your heart and your gut. Exercise grit and find your happily ever after. Namaste.